I'm very uh, academic, quite intelligent. Um, I've got a degree in mathematics and I'm very logical and um, thorough in what I do. I can see patterns in things. Uh, I actually make my living uh, through that. I'm a um, consultant software engineer. Um, and also I have a different view on life which um, means that I can make people laugh as well, which is really good. Um, so those are the plus sides if you like. Um, somewhat on the other side is I, I, I have difficulty reading facial expressions and also to an extent I, I have difficulty um, differentiating faces so uh, if there are two characters in a film that look very similar because they've been cast as sisters then they seem to be the same person with a split personality disorder perhaps uh, and I find it very difficult to differentiate um, those characters. I'm a bit different I guess and when I was at university um, you know I was perfectly accepted by my peer group but regarded as a little bit um, eccentric perhaps um, but uh, you know we got on very very well um, and uh, yeah I, I very much enjoy what I do because I'm very engaged uh, in a level of, of deep detail and that intrinsic um, motivation of what I do makes my productivity very high so long as I'm allowed to work within that area. If, um, if people try and move me out of my comfort zone, which is a, is a phrase that I really don't like very much, it's like moving me off a high mountain and into a valley. I can't see what's going on, I don't feel happy about the situation, I feel anxious about it and I can't perform anyway. So it's much better if I'm uh, allowed to develop my deep skills um, in an area that's practical and applicable to uh, whatever my employer's field of specialisation is. And in fact, my employer, I believe, uh, has quite a few people uh, with autism or Asperger's syndrome working there, each of whom will have a specific um, range of um, strengths and by employing a diversity of people, then the employer is able to, um, in that way, meet business objectives through the use of this, those people's specialisms. When you need to chop and change, it becomes a lot more complicated then. Uh, one of my um, near relatives was diagnosed, and I was very similar in characteristics, uh, was diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome. And that led me to seek to uh, get a diagnosis myself. So um, uh, I asked my GP to refer me, and she did. Uh, the funding took a long time to come through uh, for that, but eventually when I, when I was due to be diagnosed, I went to have another baseline psychiatric assessment, uh, which was fine. That was trying to work out whether or not I had things like um, schizophrenia. Because the diagnostic route is different if you've got a complex psychiatric condition than if you're you know, you know, fairly on a normal scale. Um, and I was okay for that, I was a fairly simple, simple case. And so I got referred to uh, on the simple path, or the easy path if you like, and had a, a half day assessment in Winchester um, with Dr Jacqueline Morgan. It was very pleasant and at the end of, I think it was about three, three hours of assessment. Um, fun little tasks, questions, stuff like that. Um, uh, she said, yeah, you've got, uh, you've got Asperger's syndrome. I'm very confident that you meet uh, the criteria. So that was very interesting <laughs> and quite, uh, quite revealing. Yeah. So the point is that or the, the senior psychiatrist at Marchwood Priory was unable to spot Asperger's syndrome. Um, there's a real difference between psychiatrists who've been trained to, uh, in general psychiatry, and the psychologists who are specialised in autism. And there's a quite common occurrence of misdiagnosis, which then people leads people on a wrong path to medication, inappropriate treatment, uh, when really the fundamental problem is that they are autistic and the environment is not suitable for their autism and it's the environment that's the problem, not some base psychiatric condition. For certain periods of my time I'd wondered whether I was autistic, but you have to remember that um, Asperger's syndrome is only been a diagnosable condition since 1993 and I left university in 1982 and, and um, mathematicians at Cambridge um, they have an elevated occurrence of, of 
Asperger's syndrome because the orderly thinking goes very well with mathematics. Um, so the origin originally, uh, you know, autism. My understanding of it was it had an occurrence about one in ten thousand, and so it seemed very unlikely that I would have autism because or any form of autism because it was so rare. However, understanding has moved on that it is in fact more frequent than one in a hundred, and um, you know my my alignment with engineering and mathematics and the sort of more logical subjects. Um, does well suit an autistic brain. Um, the other thing is because it was one in 10,000 and it was the very brightest mathematicians that were sampled, I assumed that I, although I was a good mathematician, I wasn't the very brightest mathematician at Cambridge. Uh, I assumed I wasn't clever enough <laughs> to, to be autistic. Um, so actually when I was diagnosed, um, it was like, wow, I am clever enough to be autistic. Um, and the other thing was because I'd been experiencing a lot of problems with security in my employment, it meant that I was then eligible to receive um, protection um, under the Disability Discrimination Act and the Equality Act. Um, so that was quite some relief. Um, and also, I guess, you know, there's a big question you'd be going through your life with, is am I or aren't I? Everybody asks the question, am I autistic? You know, just even if it's just as a, a passing thought, because everybody identifies to some extent with some of the autistic characteristics. Um, uh, that the question went away. It was confirmed that I am, um, but then it's replaced by a whole lot of other questions like, what next? So the difference the diagnosis made was it, it made me um, made me official, <laughs> as opposed to an unofficial Aspie, um, and kind of opened a few doors. So for example, I approached Autism Hampshire with the usual what next question as a person who's been diagnosed rather than as a parent. Um, and also it meant then I was starting to make social contact with people who, who had um, Asperger's or, or autism. So there are various uh, Facebook groups and uh, web-based communities and that's been very helpful as well. And then there's also things like Autscape which is a uh, uh, an annual event. It's uh, it's um, a conference, uh, a three day conference um, organised by people with autism, particularly for people with autism. Although anybody who has an interest in autism, supportive of autism, is welcome to come. Um, so that's been interesting as well. I've been involved in research because people wanted to study um, the differences between uh, people with autism, the brains of people with autism and people who, who don't have autism, or what's known as neurotypical people. Um, particularly since I live near Southampton University, they've got a, um, a psychology department there that uses an eye tracker system uh, uh, to see how you respond to various stimuli. And um, uh, they've been able to detect very minor differences in the way people um, react to certain stimuli. Particularly interesting, um, misspelled words and sentences and and things that and sentences that don't make sense have some sort of logical contradiction in them like uh, so I wanted to go to China so I learned Japanese yeah, things like that and, and how people react to those sorts of sentences so um, I'm sure there's lots of other ways in which um, I've been included as uh, the social group um, that Autism Hampshire run in Fareham um, one of the serendipity social groups um, and miscellaneous and various other opportunities as well. So, yeah, I'm proud to be autistic and uh, very much enjoy it, actually. <laughs> and why not? I don't really have deep friends. Um, certainly not close deep friends. Obviously, I'm married and I've got my family. Um, so they're very important. And I have important friends who are online. And then I've got my work colleagues. But um, I don't have people who I meet regularly and go to the pub and have a drink with. Those are not the sort of activities that I would get involved in. Yeah, I remember somebody uh, recently relating um, at work. They had to estimate. Uh, they had to estimate how long it would take them to organise a party. And one was like, you know, just get the food and drink, and we'll just do it, right? And the other one, other aspect of that was, I have that many friends. I've got to go and make some friends, and then I can have a party. Right? <laughs> Um, so I, th I guess I kind of fall on the other end of the scale. Um, but for me, uh, you know, 
online contact is great. I'm more interested in in subjects um, than in social interaction particularly. So it's where we share a common interest. That's what it forms around. So it's not about social interaction, about how people are feeling. And so these social uh, interactions tend to form around a common interest. So, for example, you wouldn't find me anywhere near a football game. I'm not interested in football, not interested in fashion, not interested in quite a lot of stuff. Um, but I am very interested in computing, interested in mathematics, interested in creative sol problem solving. Um, to some extent, I've got involved in politics a bit because of the Brexit thing. Um, so that I think that really did energise the debate within, within the country anyway, and polarised friendships. And I think friendships have been broken because of that. So um, uh, I don't really have uh, very many friends. I have a few neurotypical contacts who, who, that I've made, particularly since I did outreach work to um, an Asperger's special school where I went and I, I, I was allowed by my employer to go once a fortnight and um, teach computer engineering. And that worked really, really well because um, I had the experience and this Asperger's Special School had a pool of autistic talent that was just waiting to be released. Um, but the problem was that their staff were uh, either sort of, um, you know, cleaners and cooks and people like that, or psychologists, or teachers who had, you know, reasonable general subject skills. But the autistic person wants to get involved in a very high level of detail. And um, they kept banging up against the rules that they're not allowed to do this, not allowed to do that, not allowed to do the other. But my view is, you know, computing, uh, for example, a computer suite in the, in, the, in the school, it would be like hands off the hardware. But my take on it is, here's some junk computers, let's take them apart. What can we make with them? You know? and, and I had a small group of um, Asperger students who had behavioural difficulties because they had very challenging behaviours in that school. And, uh, and actually, when they had a common interest, not only did they, they show that interest to move forward quickly, but they actually worked well as a team because they were nucleating around that common interest. Um, and I had, uh, I had one, uh, so each, each, each um, student, I think I had three students at any one time, I'd get um, junk computers from colleagues and various other sources, they'd make them into a system, put Linux on it, which is free, and then the student could have it in their room. This is before the days of the Raspberry Pi. Um, and, uh, and then the sky was the limit, and I actually had set a password on one of these computers. Next, next time I came along, they said they'd hacked it. They'd hacked the password, and they'd uh, got root access, and they reset the computer, and they had complete control. In normal life, that would have got you into trouble. If you hack a computer at work, that can lead to all sorts of problems. I think seeing, for example, Gary McKinnon hacking into computers, getting into terrible trouble with, with the American security organisations. Um, but for me, once I got over the instant reaction of you're not allowed to do that, I'm in control, it was actually, you know, here's somebody who's, who's really gone an, ex, you know, an extra step to find out how to do that, has got enough interest to do it and has done it and shown some, some um, initiative. The problem is when that initiative becomes misdirected and it goes off in the wrong direction and, and so, you, you know, it's a mixed blessing. You've got to be careful how that's directed. Being diagnosed seven years ago now, um, it's been a bit of a journey after that point of discovery, um, and, and certainly it's been a learning process. I find things very confusing because you get you get different views of autism. You know, from the I guess the first time, some if, if you're a parent and your child gets diagnosed with autism, it's oh my goodness, it's absolutely disaster. And there there is a big autism charity in America. Um, who, whose main goal appears to be to find a cure for autism and to broadcast that autism is a disaster and they have to find a cure for it. And if they can't find a cure for it, they want to find a prenatal test for it so they can advise mothers to have terminations. So that's, that's the extreme medical view, if you like. There's actually three different communities. So there's a medical, medical community um, who regard autism as a disease. And then there's the social community, like social services and, and so forth, who regards autism as a, as a disability to be supported. And then there's the diversity viewpoint, uh, which regards autism as an interesting difference and 
what can we make of autism and can we celebrate it? So as a person who was diagnosed with autism, suddenly you find yourself in the middle of those three intersecting circles. And it's very confusing that you get you get a variety of viewpoints and a variety of reactions. Um, so, for example, the medical people, the extreme medical people, the people who want to cure it, you're saying we have to cure autism, whereas the diversity community is saying, let's celebrate it. So how do you resolve those two? Right? And then you get the, the people who, you know, because of their different roles, they will have different viewpoints anyway. So, for example, a parent's reaction is, my goodness, this is dreadful, it's a disaster. And that's what Autism Speaks, the American charity, feeds on, is parental fear. Um, but what I'm actually experiencing now, that I'm working for a, a good employer, is that actually people with autism can have a great deal to give and a unique insight. Um, and I think that people with autism have been at the, at the heart of some of... For example, some of the scientific discoveries we've made. It's thought that Charles Darwin was was probably Asperger's. Um, it was, it, you know, it was thought that Albert Einstein probably was. Alan Turing. I mean, Alan Turing's absolute hero. Not only is he, if you like, the father of modern computing, because he he essentially put forward the idea of a programmable computer. Um, but because of his work at Bletchley Park. Uh, industrialising code breaking he, and shortening the war. He probably saved hundreds of thousands of lives. We may even own our, our personal freedom to him. Um, lots of other people behind them, we're just looking at the, the famous people here. So there may well be other people in history and in present day who, who are, uh, you know, have worked on very important stuff, made huge contributions to society. Um, and uh, and may that continue? I guess lots of people kind of ask themselves the question, you know, am I autistic? Everybody has some autistic traits. Um, and there's also the fun game of Spot the Aspie. Um, everybody, I guess, has kind of played that at one point or another. But there comes a point at which you perhaps really ought to know and everybody should be aware of the likelihood that they might be autistic. And... Um, there's some work that was uh, done by Professor Baron Cohen of the um, Autism Research Centre at Cambridge. Uh, he devised a questionnaire called the Autism Quotient, which is a series of 50 questions um, that you can actually do online. Uh, so I would strongly advise anybody who hasn't already done so to go online and Google Autism Quotient, and you can do it online and you get some idea uh, sort of how, if you like, autistic you are. Now, it was designed as a as a research instrument, not as a uh, as a diagnostic instrument. Um, but actually, it's beginning to be used almost like a pre-screening test for for diagnosis now. So, one of my friends scores th three out of fifty. She's extremely neurotypical, very social. We get on very well. She's lovely, um, and I score forty out of fifty. So. So I, I'm quite well up that band. There's like, um, if you like, a sort of mean score for, for men and slightly less for, for women um, and so forth. And Professor Baron Cohen has also done some very interesting research on uh, two more quotients, systemizing quotient and empathy quotient, and compared the, the results for those for um, various populations, including men, women in, and uh I think with mathematicians, engineers, and um, people with autism. Uh, and he's developed this so-called extreme male brain theory. And it's quite interesting to see um, how that maps out. I personally believe that the reason that there are less female engineers, for example, people in the engineering, um, uh, you know, engineering um, careers, uh, is simply because it just is a tendency that um, women tend, as in general, to be more empathetic and less systemising. On the other hand, autistic people being highly systemising and less em empathetic are very well suited to the, the science, technology, engineering, mathematics um, career types. 
So um, that's quite an interesting piece of research as well. So um, what is the autistic spectrum and what is a syndrome, as in Asperger's syndrome? Uh, a syndrome is a collection of characteristics, uh, not all of which have to be present for a diagnosis to be made. So there are diagnostic characteristics for autism um, and for Asperger's syndrome, which if you like is a form of autism as well. Um, and everybody who has a diagnosis of autism uh, has a collection of strengths and weaknesses um, that are perhaps uh, more present and deeper um, than somebody who is neurotypical. Um, and similarly with the spectrum, uh, the spectrum is made up of, it's a rainbow of different colours. If you're at one point on, a, on the spectrum, then you'd have to be, you know, a monochromatic green or monochromatic red or monochromatic blue or whatever it is. So you can look at the rainbow and you can say where's brown or where's pink or, okay. or where's pastel blue, where's black. Okay, They're all colours, but none of them are on the rainbow of the spectrum. Okay? It's a composite of different light waves and different strengths um, that form colours like pink and brown and so forth. Now astronomers, when they look at starlight, they can learn a great deal by breaking down the light from a star into a spectrum. So they analyse it by wavelength and intensity and you can draw a graph. And they noticed in starlight that um, certain frequencies were missing and they could identify carbon, they could identify hydrogen, they could identify oxygen. Um, but at the turn of the century, when astronomers looked at sun sunlight in an eclipse and split it into a spectrum and looked at it, they found an element that they couldn't recreate in the laboratory. So whereas you could, for example, put some sodium in a candle and it would bright light up orange, so you put sulphur in the candle, lights up orange, they could detect sodium. They couldn't recreate that in the laboratory. The chemical they were actually observing was helium, um, which is very, very present in starlight but very rare on the Earth because it's so light it floats out of our atmosphere. And so they were unaware of helium. And that's why helium is called helium, because it's named after Helios, the, the Greek god of the sun. So helium was first discovered uh, in our star uh, through analysing a spectrum. Anyway, I digress. The point about um, uh, the autistic spectrum, for me, is that it, it effectively points to a range of characteristics where everybody has a unique pattern of those characteristics. So they have particular strengths in certain areas, particular weaknesses in other areas, but they are unique. And for people who have an autistic spectrum condition, those strengths and weaknesses are going to be deeper, more polarised. The trick is to support the deficits and, and use the strengths. So play to your strengths, try and stay in your comfort zone. A, a, a cooperative and supportive employer, for example, can be very enabling. And in fact, an autistic person in the right environment can be more productive than a neurotypical person because they're very specialised.